Hi everybody, uh, good afternoon uh, where you are, good morning from Amsterdam. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about publishing your own RxJS library and, and why you would want to do that. Uh, so first of all, I'm Tim Piper. Uh, I'm a creative technologist and open source maintainer uh, originally from Scotland, uh, based in Amsterdam now. I've been a 20 plus year full stack developer. Um, I'm an active open source maintainer. Um, I have several libraries uh, on my GitHub. Um, and I also contribute to other libraries. And I also do quite a bit of technical writing on my blog and here today speaking to you. Um, the related kind of open source libraries that you might be interested in, um, I maintain RxJS Ninja. Uh, it actually contains multiple libraries which are operators and observables for RxJS. And these are mostly for dealing with your data, whereas RxJS operators are quite low level. Um, these are slightly more higher level and allow you to do things with your strings, your numbers, uh, billions. Um, there's also observables for random values, and there's a few utility operators uh, in there as well. Um, there was going to be some changes, but with RxJS 7 coming out, um, I held off on those changes. Uh, and for example, um, RxJS now supports readable streams, uh, which was one of the um, operators that I provided. Uh, I also built a library called Formula. It's a reactive forms library for Svelte, and it comes from doing RxJS Ninja and learned a lot about reactivity. Um, and I built this library. Um, it does use React, um, sorry, Svelte stores um, to build the reactivity. Um, but in reality, other than the stores, there's nothing really specific to Svelte. So it could even be easily replaced with subjects. So. So why would you want to publish your own RxJS library when there's already uh, a lot of operators included with RxJS? Well, for one, um, you can reduce complexity in your code. Um, for example, if you have a complex business logic, like a data transformation or an application of some uh, something like a tax value or something that's, that's uh, complicated, because uh, operators are just functions, you can encapsulate this into your operator uh, and you can include that um, in your library. Uh, you can also reduce duplicate code. This is one of the reasons why I built RxJS Ninja. I find myself writing a lot of map or fu filter functions, uh, especially when dealing with strings or numbers. So here I, I wrote my own operator library to be able to reduce the amount of time um, that I would rewrite that code. And also it allows you to create contracts um, because most of the time you might be working in TypeScript. Uh, you can also easily create observables and operators that are specific to either a, a data source like an API or something like a data emitter like a, a readable or writable stream. So today we'll cover uh, create a, what is a custom operator and what is a custom observable. Um, we will touch slightly on marble testing um, and also things like documentation and, and what it takes to get a repository and pipeline in place to publish your library. Um, I do have a, a starter library here. Um, if you go here, you uh, see that uh, it includes a very basic uh, RxJS library. It has a fizzbuzz operator and a fizzbuzz observable, which isn't very useful, but it, it kind of shows the basics of how you build a library. Um, the library starter also includes all the bash scripts and YAML files that you would need to get started on GitHub with GitHub Actions to publish your library. And, the light, and this works for any TypeScript library. So it doesn't just have to be RxJS. Um, if you have your own TypeScript library you want to uh, deploy, uh, the starter library can uh, provide you sort of the template to do that. So uh, what is an operator? Uh, an operator, um, like the word computer, actually comes from uh, originally a human task uh, in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century with telephone technology, an operator uh, was a person who connected the call from one person to another. Um, you would see, you may see this in older movies where somebody calls up and the operator is asked to connect to somebody in a, a, a local area. Um, so extrapolating that into RxJS, what is an RxJS operator? Um, well, they are, first of all, higher order functions. What this means is it is the function that you import itself returns a function. Uh, the return value of that function should always be an observable value. And in fact, it should always return the source value that you get from um, the previous observable value. 
Um, you should not use operators to create new observable values. Um, so a basic structure of what an operator looks like is this. So here you can see we export our function. Um, the return of that function is an anonymous function that re receives a source. And here we uh, pipe the source to uh, other operators. Um, operators are also chainable, um, and this is what makes them very powerful. Um, you could They run in order, um, and that allows you to do things like modify values, filter, um, and even query your observable values. Um, operators can be used to do both synchronous and asynchronous actions. And of course, operators can also be uh, introduced things like side effects. So for example, if you use the tap operator or even the catch error, uh, you can use that to uh, do side effects within your system um, that are not related to the, the, the remaining stream that you're working on. Um, I like to think of combining operators as what I call kind of useful Rube Goldberg devices. Um, if you don't know what a Rube Goldberg device or machine is, um, it's it's a silly machine that that connect that it, that takes an input and there's an output at the other end. Um, the the things that have to happen between the input and output uh, can be synchronous, can be asynchronous, and they might require a certain length of time, or they might be instantaneous. Um, and in this example, for here we see there's lots of things that uh, for the user to get the napkin to their face, um, they have to pull the spoon, and then that triggers a lot of actions around it. So. Um, that's how I like to think of uh, how operators work. Um, there's two types of operators mainly. There's the monotype operator, uh, which only works with a single type. Uh, a basic example of that here is from my own library, the reverse function. Um, as you can see here, we uh, export function reverse, which returns a monotype operator function. And the, the type here will be string. Um, and here you can see what we do is we receive a string value as an observable. Uh, we're going to pipe that. Uh, in this case, uh, what I'm doing is I'm uh, destructuring it into an array, reversing the array, and rejoining it. So uh, what you get here is a string. Um, and I just have a very basic example to show here. Um, so here, for, here is the that example. Um, here you can see in the console, uh, we take the from here, and it's hello rxjs uh, We're going to pipe it into our reverse, and then we tap it. Uh, we have the value here. And just to show you with the monotype operator, if I change to number, um, you'll see that TypeScript does not like this. So this is a very nice way for you to be able to enforce the types in your system. Uh, just to also show you here that within your um, operator, you cannot obviously do any type of operation. So here, for example, uh, our monotype operator is a number. Um, here, when we, we parse this value, uh, the two fixed on a number actually returns a string. Um, so just to show you this, if I um, comment this out and try to return the string, again, uh, the monotype operator does not allow you to do that. So it, it is doing the enforcement here of our type. And finally, just to show you um, that it's not just synchronous operations, uh, here I've created a very uh, quick example using a, uh, a public API. So this is a, an operator that uh, takes a string and returns a string. Uh, but inside the operation here, we're going to fetch from an API. Uh, we switch map that to a JSON. And then here, we're going to map that back to a string. So here in our uh, console, you can see here that we have got the response. Uh, and just to show here as well, these the, the the other previous values here, where we um, we have the number um, from the uh, the operator above. Um, the other one is the operator function. Um, this is where really your operator can work with any type of value. Um, so in this case, uh, here is the the two hex function. Here we have an operator function that takes a number. And uh, it's actually going to return a string in this case. So here we, we pipe our number uh, to the to string method. Uh, we're passing a, a radix of 16. And this allows us to convert the value to uh, a hex. And again, just a very quick example to show this here. Um, if I can comment this code here. Here you can see uh, we're going to take these, uh, these three numbers here. Uh, we're going to pipe them to hex. 
And here um, we have our string value. Um, another quick example here is just to show the uh, um, what you can also do with a, an operator function is you can actually support multiple um, types in your uh, operator. So here we have one which is can be either a string or a number, but it will always return a number. Um, in here, our logic is a little bit more complicated because we first have to convert our string to number. Then we can do our two fixed and parse that again back to a number. But here we can see that um, both number and string uh, are converted here to a number format. And of course, there's observables themselves. Uh, you can create custom observables from uh, any data source. Uh, there's two types of observable. There's the code observable. Uh, this is where your data um, producer is uh, invoked every time there's a new subscription. So every time um, somebody calls your observable and calls the subscribe method, in this case, we'll always create a new data source. Um, an example from RxJS would be something like a timer. Uh, that would always start from zero in this case. Uh, this also means it's a unique instance of the producer, and it does mean that your observable should handle uh, the cleanup of both the emitter and the subscription. Um, so here, just to show you, we have our observable, which returns a subscriber. Uh, we create our emitter, and any time the emit emits a value, we will uh, emit it to our subscriber. Any time there's an error from our emitter, we're going to pass the error to our subscriber. And on end of the emitter, we're going to complete our subscription. And here in our um, return function for the observable, which is our, our teardown logic, uh, we're going to call our emitter end, which will uh, trigger this, um, this subscription complete here. Uh, we also have the hot observable. Hot observables are where, you, where your data producer lives outside of the instance of your observable value. Um, so, for example, if you have a WebSocket connection or some other readable stream, um, in this case here, we're passing it in as a property uh, to our data source here, um, but it could well be a global uh, or a singleton that lives uh, elsewhere within your, your code. Um, there's no guarantee that the producer will be a unique instance in this case. Um, if you call this function several times and pass the same emitter, then it'll always be the same instance, uh, regardless of um, the subscription that happens later. Um, and in this case, the observable is not expected to close the data producer. So um, because you're not creating that instance yourself, uh, in this case, we can just complete our subscriber uh, without having to worry about closing our emitter. That logic should happen elsewhere. Um, some use cases for custom observables, um, interop between data sources that emit over time. Uh, a very good example is the, the readable stream, for example, or web sockets, um, or even custom APIs that you may have uh, that, for example, hardware or other software uh, that you want to turn into uh, a way to uh, work with that in RxJS. Um, it can also be for emitters that follow specific rules. Uh, for example, in RxJS Ninja, there's a relatively useless operator, but uh, observable, but it's uh, from Fibonacci, uh, and it only emits uh, Fibonacci numbers starting from zero. Um, it could also be that your observable requires some custom configuration. In the case of um, from random int, which is in the, the random package in RxJS Ninja, it only emits a value between a, a minimum and a maximum. So for example, you can set the minimum to zero or one, or you can set it to uh, from 50 to 100. Uh, this allows you to customize um, the observable that you um, get. And here, I do apologize, I didn't open this example here. Uh, this is, uh, it's a bit more of a complicated example, um, but obviously you can get the link from the slides. Um, and this is where I built a, um, an operator, uh, sorry, an observable uh, that works with the dark mode uh, and light mode checking in uh, your um, browser and operating system. So this returns an observable value that you can listen to uh, when the user changes their system settings. So if I, uh, if I go to my system preferences, just very quickly, and I go to um, changing my self to light mode here, you'll see that the 
observable amidst it, I've actually changed to light mode. And you can see here already that the operating system has also picked up uh, the change in dark and light mode preferences. Um, when building a RxJS library, uh, it is very good to have testing. Um, and uh, one of the things mentioned in the previous talk as well is you do have marble testing. Uh, this allows you to, I think, test your observables and operators correctly. Um, it's designed to allow you to test data over time. So for example, you don't need to use any fake timers or use things like timeouts or intervals within your test code to mock things. Uh, the test scheduler that comes with RxJS already allows uh, this to, to be generated. Um, the tests are a visual representation of, of the expected input and output. And that means that um, by looking at a, a, a marble diagram, you can see when data should be emitted and when it should be received. Uh, and you can also see when things like subscriptions uh, should be created and um, uh, disconnected from. Uh, and you can use both hot and cold observables, as mentioned before, to create your uh, mock data sources for your testing. And the good news is that uh, there's a lot of support for doing marble testing in uh, most runners. Um, personally, I use Jest, um, and uh, I'm also using uh, this library here, um, which is um, from Nicholas from the um, RAS, uh, RxGS core team. Um, so this is an example of a marble test. So here, uh, this is testing the two uppercase operator from our XGS Ninja. And in our case here, we have a, uh, a stream of data that's coming in, uh, which is going to emit our values here. Uh, and in the case, we're just emitting A, B, and C. Um, and what we're also going to do is we're going to check the output of that, that it has actually uppercase our letters. Um, we can also here check the subscription. Uh, as you can see here, the, the two characters uh, as part of this, this is the, the start of the subscription, and this is the end of the subscription. And the reason you might want to test this is you might have an observable that, uh, or an operator that when you actually run this, you realize that it, um, for some reason, isn't disconnecting at the end of your test. And I have seen situations like that before. So this just allows you to make sure that um, whatever you're writing, um, it will dis it will disconnect from the subscription. And that means that you can avoid memory leaks in your application as well. Um, when building a, a RxJS library, I think one of the most important things is, is documentation. Um, as you know, RxJS dev has uh, quite a lot of documentation on how to uh, use RxJS and also has a lot of information for the operators. Um, for me, there's two types of documentation. Uh, the first is, in some way, probably the most important one, and that is your uh, automated documentation. So this is created from things like your JS doc tags uh, and from other comments. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to mention here, but from your TypeScript as well. Um, just to show you here, if, I, if this is the reverse uh, method here. Um, so as you can see, the reverse method itself uh, is actually really only this line, these lines of code here. Um, and actually, most of this file is actually taken up by this comment here, which is our documentation. But as you can see here, we mark a category. Um, we can put some remarks against this. And we can also provide our example and our returns. And when we do this, what we get back is um, the ability with tooling to generate automated HTML documentation. You can also generate documentation in PDF or even in Markdown to include in uh, things like GitHub. When you do automated documentation, um, that tends to be much more easy to deploy when changes are made um, because you can have that as part of your build step. Whenever uh, you make a change to your library, um, you just need to rebuild your documentation based on the changes in code, and that will deploy um, to wherever you, you have your code, be it GitHub Pages or uh, an S3 bucket. Um, the great thing is that when using TypeScript, um, so either using tools like, um, tooling like VS Code or IntelliJ, um, you actually, uh, if you include the comments in your compiled code, 
that provides full IntelliSense. And that is the example here at the bottom. Uh, this example actually does come from uh, here in um, StackBlitz, which uses a bit of a VS code underneath. And as you can see here, by, by hovering over the reverse method, I already got some information about the fact that it is a monotype operator function. Um, and what it does along with uh, a very basic example. Um, so this here, this, this tells your users how to, to use your library and what your, your contracts are, uh, what your APIs are. Um, there are several tools to generate docs. Uh, the, in my case, I have used uh, TypeDoc to generate the documentation for RxJS Ninja. Um, but there is also TxDoc and for Angular applications, uh, there's ComboDoc, which builds a, a much more visual representation of something like your Angular application. The second type of documentation, of course, is well, manual or descriptive documentation. Um, this does tend to be much more your handwritten documentation, um, and it does maybe require some tech writing skills. Um, if, you, if you want to improve your tech writing skills, it's always great to, to uh, look at op other open source libraries and see if they help, need help with their documentation. Of course, um, descriptive docs, they are a lot more difficult to automate. Um, it tends to mean that you require more of a review step. Um, and I would recommend that both when you do have a review step, that both the source file, so maybe like a markdown or your source code file is checked, um, but also have the output checked as well, uh, just to make sure that there's nothing happening within your code that might be breaking something within um, the documentation. This type of documentation is really good for your readme files. Um, so obviously think this is the, the screenshot from uh, the RxJS Ninja string library from NPM. And here you can see we have the readme, we provide links to the website, the documentation and the change log. We also have our badge for our version and we kind of cover some of the simple parts of what the library does. Um, but here I feel that this kind of documentation is great for telling your users why they should use your library. So you can also do things like blog posts. Um, the, the tools I've mentioned below, things like Docosaurus, um, that has a documentation tooling built in, but you can also have a blog section. Uh, Hugo is another um, static site generator uh, as well as Gitbook. Uh, and with both of those, you can generate um, much more rich documentation than just the automated documentation can provide. So you want to publish your library. Well, you need to think about your repositories um, and your pipelines for that. Um, best thing to do with uh, doing creating a library like this is there's actually tooling already out there to help you make repository management easier. Um, for my choice, I use NX. Um, that allows you to create a, a mono repo, which allows you to break, uh, create your libraries for publication. It uh, also allows you to create applications that you can use for things like end-to-end uh, -end testing and also for uh, other sites that you might want to build around your library. Uh, there is also Learner as well um, as another tool uh, that you can use to create your, um, your repository. Um, choose a, a repository host, for, uh, which comes with uh, potentially CI, CD. In the case of the, um, the repository I provided the link to at the beginning, uh, that is for GitHub and GitHub Actions. Um, but of course, you have GitLab with their own pipelines as well. Uh, Bitbucket also provides pipelines. Um, or if you're, if you're looking to maybe do something uh, more internal within your organization, um, you could look at other providers or even Jenkins. Um, I've written several Jenkins pipelines using very similar code um, to be able to publish libraries internally um, at an organization. So uh, with all of this, these tooling here, you can really uh, work to uh, create that um, repository which can host your code. Um, and also things for end users within your repository if it is an open source library. Uh, it's great to add things like a contribution guide to help people uh, contribute to your library. Um, you may also want to add a code of conduct um, and things like um, making sure your issues are open. You know, if, you, if, if people are using your library and consuming it, um, sometimes you find that you know, if, you, if you're writing a library, especially for yourself, that actually somebody else might come along and have a, a good suggestion or find a bug. So having your issues open is, is always something I would recommend. 
Um, when you set up your repository, I think there, there's two main things to consider. Um, the first thing is your, your pull requests. Things like pull requests really automate as much of the, the pull request process as possible. Um, you can run things like tooling, like prettier checks um, or ESLint to see that the developer themselves has, has run those for you, um, or you can automate those as part of your process. Um, and what I would always recommend is in a pull request situation is enforce a change log. Um, make sure that your developers um, update the package changes that have happened, either through a manual um, change log, for, so for example, like keep a change log, which um, I prefer, um, or there is also a uh, commit is in, uh, which is more automated. And, and for example, Angular use that. If you look at Angular or RxJS, even uh, the notes that get generated come from that automated process. But with that, you have to be much more um, better at your uh, Git commit messages uh, to make sure that the, the documentation that's generated is accurate. Obviously, you have your uh, merge to main as well. Um, with merging, I would really suggest automating your version bumping uh, and also updating anything in the change log. Um, for example, in the code in the uh, repo I've provided, um, you can put the uh, the version you want to release, whether it's a major, a minor, or a patch, in the git commit message. Uh, and when the process runs, it will automatically bump the version. It then does a production build with the version bump. Uh, and then it will um, attempt to publish that to uh, NPM. Uh, what I do is I publish uh, the libraries as uh, ESM and UMD modules. Um, the reason for that is, uh, just to show you here in the library, uh, if you publish a UMD version of the library, uh, then you can allow your users to do this. They don't need to NPM install your library. Uh, they can actually just include your script on the page. Uh, and here you can see that uh, by doing this, um, we have this global uh, variable which contains our operators, and here we can uh, import them into our script modules. Um, just to quickly cover here, um, there is some also important information here uh, when using NX. Um, personally, um, I use the, the Node uh, library that they have to generate the library because it allows you to create a publishable library and uh, fix your import path. Um, but there is a configuration here to then use the, uh, the web um, plugin for NX uh, and the package um, task from that. This allows you to use uh, Babel um, and also the, the other asset um, setup here, which allows you to generate uh, the UMD uh, and the ESM modules. If you use this, then it, it generates common JS modules and uh, you can't really use those in the browser. So there is a little bit of work with this to get um, things running, but this is already set up. Um, and even here, you can uh, use this as a template from GitHub so that you can already get started. Uh, and obviously set up um, things like token based um, or um, multi-factor authentication for NPM. Um, you should never be publishing to NPM without some kind of uh, authentication set up on your pipeline. Um, if you do, then you can have risks of things like you've seen before with um, Bitcoin miners being put into libraries. Um, I mean, with, that, with your library, it might be small and single, uh, single line, so it's a bit harder to do something like that. But it's just always good to have uh, some kind of um, process set up where um, even with automation, you still have a step of either uh, doing the, the multi-factor authentication um, or you provide a token that only has the scope for uh, publishing from GitHub, for example. So now that we've done that, um, it's time to start promoting your library. Um, I mean, get out on Twitter, um, write blog posts about it, and you can even do something like this, which you can talk at a conference. Um, so thank you very much um, uh, for attending the talk and I hope you've enjoyed the, the, the talk so far and enjoy the rest of your day.